Hey guys, Alex here from On Street Garage and today I've got some awesome news. The Land Cruiser has finally arrived from Japan in Australia. And I thought now would be a good opportunity to let you guys know what's involved, including time, uh, what sort of documentation needs to be done, what it costs, and my opinions on whether it was worth it now that I know exactly what it's gonna cost me to have it here ready for my FTE swap. Today we're going to deep dive into the process of importing a car from Japan into Australia and we'll be using my Japanese 100 series as a live example, bringing it into New South Wales in Australia. It's important to note you can apply this process to almost any vehicle, however, there will be minor changes state to state. So if you're not in New South Wales, make sure that you have a look with your local authority and get an idea on what the specifics are. And make sure you hang around to the end because I'm gonna list every cost that I've spent on this so far, including what I actually paid for the car. I know a lot of you guys are interested in that as I think it probably works out cheaper than buying an FTE secondhand in Australia. By the end of this video, you'll know where to source these cars, how to go about purchasing one, and any pitfalls to look out for when you're shopping overseas. At the end of the video, I'll share a few tips and tricks that I've learned along the way, as this isn't my first import, and hopefully I can help you guys skip out on some of the mistakes that have cost me a little bit of money and some disappointment. But before we deep dive into this, I wanted to give you guys some updates on what I've been up to. I've had so much going on. I've been a bit slow on the videos because work has been super busy as well. But as you can see in the background, the Land Cruiser is really starting to take shape. It's reaching its final form. And thanks to you guys and your feedback and experience, rather than pull this one apart to do the FTE swap, I've made the decision that it's a bit too nice and probably worth a bit too much to pull apart. It wouldn't really be doing it justice. So the plan is going to be that we finish this, we do the last of our highway testing on the 1H shed, and then the car will be up for sale. In saying that, I've already bought another car for the donor. Um, I'm gonna give you guys a quick look at it here in this clip. It's pretty awesome. It was a lot cheaper than anywhere near what I paid for the 1H shed. It's got some really cool mods in it that are gonna come in handy. So in the next couple of weeks, I'll do a detailed run through. I'll give you guys a look at that car and what exactly it is. Of course, when it comes to importing a car into Australia, it isn't as simple as clicking a button and then it arriving at your door a few weeks later. Australia has import rules that ensure that cars being bought into the country meet a minimum requirement and that they're tracked so that they know what cars are in here and that they've been bought up to an appropriate standard. They do this via the ADRs or the Australian Design Rules and VIAs or Vehicle Import Approvals. At this point, I'd like to highlight how important it is that you speak to a good broker you can do this yourself, however, I've tried it once and the amount of headache was absolutely not worth it. I personally have used Scott from Nippon to You. I'm gonna put a link to his business in the description. I'm not getting paid to put his name out in this video, but I've now imported a few cars to him and found him very helpful. However, there are a lot of really good importers, so do your research and find someone that you feel comfortable with that suits what you're looking for. So the Australian design rules are a set of minimum standards that a car must meet if it's going to be registered in Australia. If a car that you import doesn't meet those standards, it can become a costly exercise to get it to a point where it can be registered. Some of the typical things I've come across in multiple cars over the year are things like seat belts need, needing to be upgraded, uh, intrusion bars, some of them don't have them in the door so they have to be retrofitted and welded in. And also tires is a very common one, as sometimes the tires we require over here aren't the same in Japan. These ADRs must be adhered to before the car can be registered in Australia. So it's very important to speak to your broker or do your research to get an idea of what needs to be done to a specific model before you decide to lay down your hard earned and bring it into the country. The second very important part is a vehicle import approval. Now you must have a vehicle import approval before you bring a car into the country. Again, I would recommend speaking with a broker to make sure that the car is eligible to come into the country and that there are no specific issues with it that may make it difficult. The final step before going ahead and buying a car would be making sure that there's no special requirements that are vehicle specific. Some cars, especially older ones, would need things like an asbestos clearance certificate, which can become problematic as asbestos was present in some old engine gaskets brake pads and things like that. Some will need degassing of their air conditioning and some will need specific steam cleaning. These are just a few of the things. These are all things to consider when choosing the appropriate vehicle to import. So now that you know what vehicle you want, you're aware it's eligible for import and you're aware of any specific extra work it may need, now is the fun part. It's time to buy. There are a few different ways to buy vehicles and in the past I've tried a couple of them 
But these are the main ones and I'll explain why the one I've chosen is my preferred method. So the most economic and where the best deals are in my opinion is by going to the vehicle auctions in Japan. And it's important to note that not all vehicle auctions in Japan are the same. Some auctions are open to the general public and they're exposed to things like dealers reselling, people covering up issues with cars and putting them back through the auctions. And you're bidding against a really large audience. Pretty much anyone with the internet can get online and they can bid on these cars. Also the advantage of these auction houses is that you can get online yourself, you can see the cars and in some cases you can bid on them yourself. It's not always the best way and it's not my preferred method. I found that the best quality and the best value vehicles are generally at the USS auctions. These auctions are generally accessed by dealers only, so you can potentially pick up a vehicle at wholesale price. This eliminates a large amount of people bidding against you and the quality of the vehicles that come through is generally of a higher quality. It's still imperative that you have the vehicle looked over before bidding as there are still some that slip through the cracks where there's been some tidy ups or cover ups and they may not look as good in real life as they seem in the photos. If you're one of the unlucky ones that manages to purchase one of these cover ups, it can leave you extremely disappointed at the other end when it's far too late to have any sort of recourse on the purchase. And at this point I know I'm probably sounding like a broken record, but for me, I always use a broker as they will generally have someone at the auctions who can look at it physically, take photos of the inside, underside, and they'll know some of the typical things that happen with specific models. So the process I've gone through is I generally pay a refundable deposit so that if we don't buy anything, I get my money back. And once he has that, we can start shopping. I generally have a list of things that are must-haves and nice-to-haves. These are typically my budget, the kilometers that I'd be happy for the vehicle to have, the condition, which they're graded in auction, but that's not always reliable, color and trim level. Some cars will also have modifications where some will be stock. So it's interesting to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis and adjust your budget depending on what you're bidding on. If you'd like to know more about the grading system and the auction sheets that come with the car, Drop it in the comments and I'm happy to go into a more in-depth video where we'll discuss this specific feature. So once the importer has all of my details, they generally will start sending me through vehicles that fit within what I've said in my parameters. There's photos of the vehicles and the auction sheet will usually have some brief comments mentioning any modifications, any special features or any issues that the car might have. From here, the importer will send me cars that they believe are going to sell around my budget. I'll take a look at them all. If there's any that catch my attention, I'll go back to them and say, let's bid up to a certain amount of dollars and we wait for the auction day to arrive. The auctions themselves are extremely quick, which each individual auction usually only lasting around 20 seconds. If we don't win any of the cars that I'm interested in, the option is generally to have your refund deposited and you can go about your day doing whatever you want to do or wait for the next auction. There's usually a couple a week. Have a look at the cars that are going through there and decide whether you're willing to bid on any of them or not. A third option that I think is worth mentioning is you can buy directly from dealers in Japan. Now, this isn't something that I've personally done as I found the prices are generally heavily inflated and there's also ample opportunity for the dealers to cover up issues with the cars. So I don't believe you're getting the best deal you could get. However, sometimes they'll have something unique that you may really want. So it's definitely an option that's worth considering. So this part's New South Wales specific, but if you've won a vehicle, the next step is to apply for that vehicle import approval. And to do that, you need to get on the infrastructure New South Wales website and create an account with what they call Rover. From here, you can apply for the vehicle import approval online yourself through the portal and pay the application fee. Some importers may take care of this part of the process for you. In my opinion, the shipping process is probably one of the easiest parts of all of it. Once you've won a car at the auctions, it will then go into a queue to be loaded onto a ship delivered to where you choose it to be delivered to. I generally use uh, roll on roll off or sometimes it's abbreviated to a row row. This type of delivery, the vehicle is driven onto the ship, parked and when it arrives at its destination, it's driven back off. You can get your car packed into a container. This will obviously protect it a little bit better. However, it is quite a lot more expensive. So something that you need to weigh up depending on the vehicle you've bought and how worried you are about it getting scratched or dented. In terms of the shipping time itself, typically, and what has been the case with my 100 series, is it takes about two weeks from the time it leaves Japan to the time it arrives in New South Wales at Port Kembla. During this period, there's paperwork to be filled out to get the car cleared through customs, there's GST to be paid and a few other bits and pieces. The shipping company will assist with this and they generally send through documents and requests for information where they need it. To get customs clearance, you'll generally need the following documents. You'll need a vehicle import approval, 
You need to lodge an import declaration. You have to pay customs duty. You have to pay GST. You may have to pay luxury car tax depending on the car. You'll have to ensure that there's no asbestos present and then sign a declaration stating that. And finally, you have to lodge a quarantine entry and have the vehicle inspected, which is usually organized by the broker or the shipping company. Once a vehicle is cleared through quarantine, which can be anywhere from a few days to a couple of weeks, then it's time for a tow truck to be organized with the appropriate clearance to enter the ports, which will come and pick the vehicle up and deliver it to wherever you decide. In my case, I'm having the car delivered straight to my house as I'm not going to be registering it so it doesn't require blue slips or further inspections. From here, depending on the age of the car, there's generally two paths that you go down from this point. The vehicle's over 25 years of age. The process is probably the simplest and most streamlined. The vehicle needs to go to either a mechanic or an engineer where it has its new VIN plate affixed to it, which is given to you by the infrastructure or whoever your state authority is when you get a vehicle import approval. It will then have a blue slip or roadworthy inspection done to ensure that the vehicle is safe to be driven on the roads in Australia. Once this is completed in New South Wales, you can take your purchase receipt, you can take your roadworthy or blue slip, you can take an application for new vehicle registration, and you can usually get the car registered then and there. And just like that, you're on the road. For newer cars, or things that aren't quite 25 years old yet, there's a different compliance pathway, which is through a RAWS or Registered Automotive Workshop. These are specific workshops that hold compliance for particular models and have a list of upgrades required for certain vehicles to bring them up to specification. This process is quite a bit more expensive and a workshop that holds compliance for your specific model should be consulted before you import the car. I've been through this process with a couple of my cars. I had a Toyota Crown, I've had an S15 Silvia, and whilst it's a straightforward process, it is a bit more time consuming and it is definitely more expensive. Okay, so now we get down to the pointy end. We're gonna talk about costs involved and we're gonna use my Land Cruiser, which I've just imported as a live example again. The one that everyone wants to know is how much I paid for this car. So the cost, which is listed as FOB or freight on board, which means it includes the broker's fee, and trucking to the docks out of Japan, but not the shipping to Australia, uh, was $13,800. So for me, I thought that was an absolute steal. Yes, it has a little bit of rust in the chassis, but we're not using the chassis. Um, it was a great starting point, and it just seemed like value to get an FTE alone. The international freight roll on roll off was a little bit more than what it's been in the past. I think the cost of everything has gone up in the last couple of years. So that was $3,005. It's worth noting that if you're importing a smaller car, it will be cheaper as they charge you on volume, not per car. From there, I had to pay GST on entry, which was just over $1,600. There's a customs electronic fee, which who knows what that is, they're just taking their piece off. That was $215. Delivery is $440 to get it to my house. And there was a heat treatment that's also required and I think that's got to do with killing pests or something that could potentially be in the vehicle, which was $250. So as I won't be registering this vehicle, that is my all in cost to have it delivered to my door. This gives me a total of $19,312.47. In my opinion, this is a great deal. I looked at buying just an FTE by itself and it was around $18,000 for something that was complete with all the accessories ready to be bolted in. So for $1,000 more, I've got a cab, I've got a full interior gearbox transfer case, and I've seen the engine running, I get to see the engine running at the other end, and it's only got 250,000 Ks. So this to me is just a no brainer. I think it's absolute value, especially if you're thinking about swapping the cab as well as the engine like I am. And if you weren't, you can part the cab out. There's plenty of dollars to be had there. I'm gonna be parting out the chassis suspension wheels off the 100, and that will obviously be a little bit of money clawed back for what I've spent on this vehicle. If the car was being registered, I've given some very conservative numbers here and I would allow the following to get it to that next stage. To get it to a mechanic and allow for some basic repairs would be around $1,800, a blue slip inspection of $80, a registration fee of $70, motor vehicle tax of around $550 and a green slip also around the $500 mark. At this stage, you would have an FTE 100 series Land Cruiser with a full year's rego, low kilometers, turbo diesel, and you'd still only be just over $22,000. For the condition of this cab, interior, and engine, again, I still think it would be really good value. However, it's just not the path I'm going down. So if you're thinking about importing something to keep, this is the sort of cost you should expect to add on. 
So in reality, from the time I bought it, it was approximately $9,000 more to have it on the road ready to go. So with all of this in mind, what would be my tips and tricks? I've done a few cars over the years now as imports and there's definitely a few things that have rung true for me and there's been a few disappointments or things that I didn't expect that I'm gonna try and stop you guys from having happen to you. My number one advice is get a good broker and make sure it's on with a solid track record. Do your research, have a chat to them, make sure you like them, make sure that they've got good reviews. A broker helps every step of the way and they honestly make such a big difference to the process. The next one would be to make sure you know your budget and have enough set aside for your shipping and repairs. I got caught out with this with my very first import. I bought an S15 when I was about 21 years old and I thought I bought the car at auction, I allow a couple of grand and I'll be good to go. When I got to the other end and it needed compliance, then it needed shipping, taxes, rego, it put me in a tricky spot where I had to find money quick and it was all my fault, I just hadn't done my research. So make sure you haven't just got enough to buy the car, but you've got enough to get it here. And again, if you're not gonna be registering it as for parts, you wanna allow five to 6,000. If you're going to be registering it, allow for worst case and you know add 9,000 on top. I cannot stress enough how important it is that you get the vehicle inspected in Japan and get a good photo record taken by whoever's done the inspections. There's a lot of cars that roll through the auctions. The camera quality is very grainy and not very good. And they might look great on the outside, but there can be some nasty surprises underneath them or in little nooks and crannies. So make sure you pay someone, if you're seriously interested in the car, to look at it in person before you bid and take heaps of photos and send them all to you. This 100 series, I got a folder of I think 80 photos before I bit the bullet and handed over my hard earned. And last but not least, be patient. Take your time and enjoy the process. This is one of the most exciting things for me when it comes to cars, is being able to buy a car from another country and bring it over here. You get something so unique, you get something that you're the first owner in the country, and it just brings all that history with it from Japan. So have fun with it, but don't be in a rush and buy the first one that you see. Wait for that perfect car, because it is a big investment and it takes some time. But overall, I think importing is a great way to get your hands on Japanese vehicles in better than average condition for a great price. I've done it multiple times now, and I've always been happy with what I get at the end. The overall condition is always spot on. And in the case of this 100 series, I think it's just an amazing price. And these prices won't last forever. As some of you probably know, once they hit 25 years old, the US market also has access to them. And it's happened with things like my Chaser, uh, the Toyota Supra, my old Prado, once America can get them, the price very quickly inflates because they leave the country into America super quick. So make sure that that's something you take into account also. Last but not least, I'd always encourage you guys to do your own research. Don't cut any corners. Make sure you've done everything you can to satisfy yourself that this is the right thing for you. I'm not a professional. I've done it a few times. And I'm just trying to share my experiences. I think it's great, but you need to be comfortable with it too because what works for me might not work for you guys. So coming up next, the donor car is here. I've got a really short clip of it. I'm gonna be doing a full walk around on that next. Uh, by the time that's done, I should have the 100 series in my hands. So we'll be doing a full walk around on that. And then we'll be cracking right into getting that FTE swap and cab swap happening. And in the meantime, this Land Cruiser here, we'll be finishing it off. We'll be doing the towing test. We've got a couple other bits and pieces and I'll show you what the painting process has looked like so far. I'm gonna give you guys a quick look at it. I'm super stoked with how it's looking. I just think this gray, I just think this gray looks so good. It's coming up really nice, love the color. And look, I'm not doing it the most efficient way. We're sort of doing panel by panel, pull the panel off at a time, paint it inside and out, make sure it's done properly. Um, it's just the best way that works for me. And if this car is something that one of you guys might be interested in, shoot me a message. We're still a little while away from letting go of the car. I've still got a few things I'd like to do with it, but you've seen all the maintenance. It's a cracking car. It's been set up as good as a 1HZ can be set up. So yeah. All right guys, so we'll wrap it up there. If there's anything you wanna ask me about this process further, drop it in the comments. I'm always happy to answer your guys' questions and help out wherever I can. And if you guys wanna help me, we've got a bunch of merch up now in the shop. I'm gonna put a link in here. We've got all sorts of different colors and designs. I've done a bunch of 105 stickers, so check those out as well. Anything you do to support me, it's just money straight back into the channel so we can keep building awesome cars and get out and use them. 
So thanks as always, and I'll see you guys all in the next one.